Dobar dan, bonjour. Hi. So we have a guest today. So Emilio Garcia. Um, I can see you, you also have uh, Ismael, Ismael Gar Garcia. Is that your second name? Or? Well, my full name is Ismael Emilio Garcia, but I go by my middle name, Emilio. Mm. I see. All right, cool. All right. <laughs> so Emilio is uh, only 16 years old, but he's already a polyglot. He's bilingual in English and Spanish, and he speaks fluent French and Italian. He's also learning Portuguese and interested in Latin. So as you probably see the pattern, he's interested in Romance languages. And he has been so kind as to prepare a presentation for us today. Yeah. So, so, hi, Emilio. First, can you please uh, introduce yourself? Of course. So. Um, just before I start, just a little disclaimer. So since uh, I'm in high school, I obviously don't have any degrees in the Romance languages. So I'm just going to share uh, my personal experiences, what I've learned uh, over the past few years. Um, so just a small disclaimer. But um, my name is Emilio. Uh, uh, I'm an IB diploma student. Um, I grew up bilingual because my parents uh, speak Spanish um, and I live in the United States. So I've always spoken Spanish and English. And then uh, a few years ago, I started learning French at school. Um, and then about a year ago, I started uh, learning Italian. And then uh, recently I've started um, learning Portuguese. Uh, so I was born in the United States, but my dad is Puerto Rican and my mom is Peruvian. So that's where the Spanish comes yeah. from. Um, and usually people say they can't tell uh, where I'm from by my Spanish mm -hmm. accent. So mm -hmm. maybe it's more neutral, but I don't really like to use the word uh, neutral. Um, mm -hmm. So... Great. So how did it work for you? Because we're very interested. Our son is also bilingual or even trilingual. And so each of us would always speak to him in our respective language. And then English would be more like the language of maybe reading, watching things, yeah. kind of formal language or something. So how did it go for you? That's a great question. So. Um, my parents just both would speak in Spanish to me first. Um, they, I don't remember exactly, but they tell me that they would label things in Spanish mm -hmm. and English, like around the house, like mm -hmm. la silla, the chair, uh -huh. the table, stuff like that. Um, That's super and, cool. Yeah. Luke Ranieri does this with Latin, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> And eventually, um, since I started uh, going to school uh, and since I live in the United States, I was just exposed to English. But now over time, it's kind of become more of a mix. So we speak in Spanglish, you mm -hmm. could say. Yeah. Um, we mix both languages. But yeah, so technically my first language is Spanish. But because I live in the U.S., I think my English has become better than my Spanish. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Well, well very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so yeah, like I can see the you're you're really quite accomplished in terms of like learning uh, Roman languages. Was Thank was the uh, Spanish the starting point for this uh, this interest? Or? That's a great question. So when I was about nine years old, I had to take French uh, in school. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I liked it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I wasn't it wasn't my main passion back then. Um, mm -hmm. It was only twice a week for three years it was like very basic stuff like je m'appelle stuff like mm -hmm. that yeah. um and then when i was about 12 uh years old i switched 
to a new school. Um, and there I started learning a lot more French. Um, and then I realized that it really interested me. And then on YouTube, I kind of went down a rabbit hole of just videos about polyglots, languages, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. Spanish wasn't exactly the starting point. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it was just kind of a little bit random. It's hard to really pinpoint how it mm -hmm. came to be, but it's more of a the past four uh, five years is when that interest really sparked. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah that that's uh I was interested in this because um, even though like it's uh, very straightforward to like learn both Latin languages in a like a like mixed bag and you can clear find a big bag and you can clearly see the link between all of them. There are like slight differences, and I was kind of curious, like how, like uh, yeah, <laughs> you we'll be talking to, about yeah. that definitely. So yeah, well, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of just learning them, um, I think there's a misconception that because they're so similar, it's easier mm -hmm. to learn them. But I think it also makes it harder because you have to get the subtleties and the small differences to really speak the the language yeah yeah it's true yeah i can totally relate to that in in relation to russian for example sometimes the vocabulary is so similar to bulgarian that i wonder if a word exists or not and i'm like yeah. if i say it and it doesn't exist i will mm. feel very silly but then if it exists <laughs> then i just don't say it as if i don't know it mm. it's yeah, yeah. The way it's it yeah the patterns are always helpful to mm. uh to look for when you're mm -hmm. when you're learning them um yeah and then there's false friends too which can confuse mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. um like uh like entendre mm -hmm. in french means yeah. to hear right but in yeah, spanish yeah. In in the the means yeah. to understand mm -hmm. so that's a false friend right mm -hmm. because yes. it's similar but not really the same thing Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's a it's a pretty good example yeah <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Mm. there's some of this and uh, actually i think um my french teacher said we were reading this play last year called georges dandin um mm -hmm. by moliere and mm. uh she she said that entendre because in the play it's used like in Spanish and mm. then so I yeah. think uh, it's a more recent development to use it as to hear um, yeah 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly like it would be a old fashioned way of uh, saying like uh, if someone um, tells you something and you actually want to mm -hmm. kind of like uh, say okay I, I get you but there is more to the situation I want to say you would say oh, j'entends bien j'entends bien mais <laughs> yeah so, I feel you yeah. yeah it's a bit like I feel you there but <laughs> yeah and in in Italian there's intendere which is mm -hmm. similar but it's not really used that much it's more capire right capis oh. yeah mm -hmm. right um yeah. and in Portuguese it's like Spanish entende mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and yeah like capish and comprendre it's again like uh, <laughs> you could lump, lump them like together yeah, I suppose, it's but... a common Latin. Mm -hmm. like to comprehend a little bit mm -hmm. like in yeah. English yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so should yeah. I go to the next yeah sure oh, yeah, yeah. please do. please okay um so just a little most of you probably know what they are, but just to give a small introduction. So uh, the Romance or Neo-Latin, new Latin languages come from vulgar Latin, right? Mm -hmm. Because you had the, the classical Latin and then the vulgar Latin, which was spoken by the people, right? Not vulgar as in necessarily <laughs> like bad words or stuff like that. It just meant of the people um, and then the five main ones are Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian and Romanian 
in order of uh, native speakers. Um, and then other examples are Catalan, Occitan, Venetian, Galician, Sardinian, Sicilian, Corsican, Provençal, Romanche, the list, the list goes on. There's a lot of uh, Romance languages. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you made a, like, actually, I think you managed to cover the um, kind of like the subtlety better than I did in my video about uh, different accents because sort of presented the um, kind of Occitan as this big, uh, like chunk where it's actually really quite varied like you yeah you have like a Provençal is actually quite different from the dialect spoken in these so yeah it's uh every yeah. year <laughs> yeah have you have you been exposed to any of those french regional languages or not really um not really um uh, so I, I grew up in the basically it's uh it's an area that is um uh sort of uh so it's uh two hours uh, south from paris so it's really what you could consider like really central france but mm -hmm. there is an area nearby that is uh that was initially the kingdom of burgundy like there was the duke of Bur burgundy and it was actually independent for really quite a long time and uh they um, my grandparents were from, uh, were from there and the dialect was actually a bit different but honestly it was more like broken french with like some uh, specificity of, uh, and uh you know you would say like something like uh if you want to take a stroll they would say something like bagnodi and like i would sometimes say that word and nobody knew what it was like in, <laughs> in, uh, in school so yeah that, that that type of thing like it's not really uh can't really consider it like a proper like so proper we have experience with the alsatian but it's not even a latin dialect is it yeah i don't know i guess it wouldn't be referred to as any sort of german dialect but maybe germanic um, in it, origins at least it is germanic uh, the, it's it's spoken in on the border between France and Germany, right? Yeah, Somewhere. yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's um some older form of uh, like German, like I think the actual term something like Altdeutsch or something like that. Maybe, so yeah, yeah. and uh, but I'm very interested in uh, Romance. Uh, it's from um, Swiss, uh, Switzerland, isn't it? It's a dialect spoken in Switzerland. It's like the it's the Germanic Romance language. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think uh, I don't know if you know the channel Echo Linguist, but he made mm -hmm. a video with a Romance speaker, and it was interesting because it sounded mm -hmm. I couldn't really understand it by hearing it at yeah. all. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm. that that, that yeah out. definitely we would like if you can link it to us I'll it out we'll be delighted to, <laughs> to have a look because I'm, I'm interested I heard of it but that, that was about it like yeah. uh, um mm. there's a huge variety of romance languages um yeah so yeah. um so uh this is a quote from a from from a linguist, uh, a language is a dialect with an army and navy. Uh, so because the term dialect is very political, right? To say mm -hmm. that, um, for example, Catalan is a dialect of Spanish. Oh, when it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, it, when it technically is a sister language, right? Because yeah. Catalan yeah. doesn't come from Spanish. It comes from Latin, right? So mm -hmm. all of those dialects are really just sister languages that haven't had that political um, power, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because there's a lot of, uh, like, I'll always hear people, like, kind of refer to dialects and, like, uh, like looking down upon them because... Mm -hmm. Because yeah, the term it's a hierarchical relationship between yeah. the, the popular language and mm. its <laughs> dialects. Yeah. Yeah, because the term itself is like, you know, it's separating it from a mm. language, right? It's, uh -huh. it's taking yeah. away that that power, right? So if you speak mm. um like I don't know, Venetian in Italy, you speak a dialect, it's not a language, but it mm. really if you compare it to standard Italian, it's very different. It has its own rules. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm. 
and um, it's true that the um, like basically the the uh, kind of like the the, the big countries like uh, especially I know especially about France and Italy we try to simplify it as much as possible uh, the local dialects to the extent that we actually delegitimize them. Uh, I know it's yeah. a big issue in Corsica, for example, like uh, Corsicans are really mad about the fact that uh, their language wasn't recognized until like recently as uh, something really strong and official. So, yeah. Yeah. It's cool to, to teach dialects. Yeah, nowadays, uh, yeah. Nowadays. yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, if we take Italy, because I know a little bit more about the history there, yeah. um, it wasn't until 1860 mm. that standard Italian was a thing, right? That wasn't, yeah. it's more of an artificial language, because what they did to unify Italy was they took Dante's Fiorentine dialect, mm. and yeah. then standardized it and imposed it upon people right and especially with the tv and the advancement of technology um the other dialects are slowly um dying yeah. off mm -hmm. uh, but uh in spain what i like is that i've heard that they teach both spanish and the regional language uh, like in yeah. barcelona they'll teach Spanish and Catalan at school. They won't, mm. they won't just ignore Catalan. Um, and I think that's important, right? To keep a part of the history and the culture um, and the benefits of just being bilingual in general, right? Yeah, yeah, mm. of course. Mm, completely. And uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll try not to talk too, too long about this, but it's interesting to see that um, like France and Italy are centralized, like uh, at least I can really speak for France, but everything kind of centers around Paris when it comes to kind of political decisions. Whereas Spain is a kind of a community, a sort of community of uh, regions like uh, mm. like uh, Germany. So they're more, uh, they're more willing to express their own culture. And you get an interesting bias, at least for France, because um, that's what I was uh, talking about my video. I didn't really mention it, but standard French really comes, they, this idea is like really the kind of higher part of France, like the northern parts, which is uh, less uh, kind of um, a southern, like you will have less like Mediterranean influence and a bit mm. more of like uh, Germanic and well, yeah, Anglo-Saxon influences and like kind of reduce this notion of like, this is a, like the, your, your pure Latin language. So mm. it you know, like a lot of people might feel excluded by, uh, by this, well, excluded by this. And uh, not only like there are people that speak some really specific uh, local languages, like let's say the Basque area, like the Scara or like uh, the, uh, in uh, Brittany, like the Breton, but also people from the South because um, they have like some kind of like singing, um, like we call it uh, l'accent chantant, which is, uh, yeah, you know, a bit, uh, yeah, a, a a bit, bit more of a tonic uh, yeah, ex accent ex that's exactly. not there normally. Exactly. And we say it's like, oh, that's, uh, that, that's quirky. That's funny. It's, uh, it sounds nice. It's uh, like, we won't take it as seriously as someone who speaks right. like uh, kind of a yeah, Nordic kid, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, like Parisian, like, uh, wait, so yeah um mm. and also the question of like standardization is mm. a is a different one that's interesting right because standard italian like does anyone really speak standard italian with yeah. the, all of those specific rules and stuff because mm -hmm. because in every region there's slight differences in like the pronunciation the vowel quality and stuff um, and if you take Spanish, for example, um, like what is a more standard neutral accent? Is it the one from Madrid with the ceceo and all of that? Or is it something from Peru, Mexico? What's, what's the more standard uh, mm -hmm. accent? Yeah. Yeah, it must be also like with the Spanish, could be interesting to compare like Latin American, for the like Southern and uh, 
Latin American and uh, and uh, Spanish from uh, like European Spanish, I guess like uh, the differences must be interesting to as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maybe well, English, American English mm -hmm. the varieties as opposed to dialects. Yeah, I mean the main differences are one of them is the ceseo, right? The distinction mm -hmm. between the S and the C and the Z, right? Because in mm -hmm. Spain instead of saying um, cancion, they'll mm. say cancion with a mm. th sound. Um, mm. And then yeah. the J is also more of a ch sound. Uh, and I think that has to do with Arabic influence from the Moors. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. And the S is also like a retracted S, um, like, a, like a more low pitch, like instead mm -hmm. of a right mm -hmm. um, so those are like some of the main differences mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. yeah and and then in argentina uh because of uh italian influence um and other and from other immigrant communities uh the spanish is also very different right like they'll say shomechamo instead mm -hmm. of Right, yeah, because you have yeah, very specific, yeah. Because in some countries it's a y sound, in some it's a j sound, mm -hmm. and in mm -hmm. some it's a sh sound, so mm -hmm. um, that's uh also interesting. Um, yeah, and the Spanish you speak is more uh Spain, like. Well, yeah. yeah, this is what, what we learn here when mm -hmm. we learn. And even though my Spanish teacher, who, who actually teaches me in the channel, yeah. um, she's from Argentina, but she mostly tries to do the um, neutral or like Spanish when there is differences in vocabulary. She mm -hmm. does the continental, like the European yeah. Uh, Spanish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although, yeah, the accent, of course, uh, yeah. she doesn't change that, which uh, is, is great. That would be weird. But at least in terms of vocabulary, mm. um, right. students yeah, would, would expect it to be uh, Spain-based. Mm. And another big yeah. difference I forgot to mention is in the subject pronouns, right? So yeah. in, Spain, yes. in Spain, you have yo, tu, El, ella, usted, nosotros, vosotros, mm -hmm. el, ellas. But then yes. in Latin America, you have yo, tú, usted, el, ella, nosotros, ustedes. Mm -hmm. el, no, vosotros, el, yeah. Because yeah. in Spain, um, ustedes is more of a formal usage mm -hmm. from what I understand. But in Latin America, it's just usted. Ustedes, no mm -hmm. nosotros, right? There's yes. no vu, voy, that doesn't exist mm -hmm. in Latin America. So the first time I took Spanish at school, my teacher was from Spain, right? So I had to mm -hmm. get used to uh, mm -hmm. the vosotros um, yeah. kind of thing. Uh, and then in Argentina, they have the vos, right? The voseo, the mm -hmm. V-O-S. Um, mm -hmm. Like they'll use that uh, instead of two, not just in Argentina and some other countries mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then uh, that's interesting because vosotros is that vos that the Spain, Spanish and other countries lost, right? Vos mm -hmm. otros, like you, mm -hmm. other, right? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, interesting also. Um, yeah. And well. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. fascinating to, mm. to break down things. Yeah. yeah. And then in mm. Portuguese too, right? Like tu yeah. instead of você, right? That that's mm. also uh, mm. I don't know as much as about that, but I know that mm. that's a big difference between European and Brazilian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we we assume as much, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we're not very familiar with uh, Portuguese. Mm. So yeah, like, uh, <laughs> but from what I've uh, like gathered here and there, like uh, yeah. I had like both like uh, Portuguese and uh, Brazilian classmates when I was in uni, and yeah, but 
there's a bit of a difference there as well. <laughs> but yeah. Mm. Like, uh, and then in terms of French, like Canadian French. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. French, like so, the accent is, is different. Um, um, well, my, uh, one thing that is funny, my mom has um, uh, Norman origins, like more or less. And uh, she, she had a laugh because the, uh kind of uh, the Quebecois, which uh, they have a pretty specific accent but the way they pronounce things are more or less a derivative of uh, this uh, norman accent so they say like they they talk more or less like my the my, the way my grandparents did like with like some english words like thrown in the mix oh. so <laughs> basically she was having a blast over that <laughs> yeah oh, uh, it's Cool. But it, it sounds really quite specific. Like if you put me in front of a uh, like a, a, a film in uh, like French Canadian, uh, we'll probably not understand. Yeah, I need subtitles. Yeah, if I watch yeah. Them. When I um when I talk to someone in in French and I expect like sometimes I'll expect them to speak metropolitan Parisian French, but then they'll yeah. speak. <laughs> with a Canadian accent and then it takes me a minute to yeah. understand mm. what they're saying. Um, yeah. There's like small differences, like instead of la vidéo, they mm. say le vidéo. In yeah. Oh, really? mm. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. We, we had an interesting interaction with like some, uh, so like uh, two selling ladies from uh, Quebec that came to France to like sell some uh, um like uh, canadian products uh in like in the marketplace it was, uh, christmas yeah. market in yeah. Alsace, so yeah. guess, kind of a bit crafty mm. homemade uh, products mm. and, and uh, yeah <laughs> like, yes i was explaining to them something that i wanted maple syrup um without alcohol because they were making it with alcohol so um i just said can i have it without alcohol and they said in english why and I, I just switched to English and started talking to them. And then they said, je ne parle pas anglais. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they said, why? <laughs> I yeah. assumed they wanted to continue in English. So, yeah, they, they actually, like, um, use English, but almost with, without, the, like, without the context of, uh, sometimes mm. without the context of, like, uh, English as a language, sorry. <laughs> the right. best way I can put it, uh, yeah. Because, because in Canada, the majority of the population speaks Canadian English, right? And yeah. then, mm -hmm. but in metropolitan French, there's a lot of Anglicism, right? Uh, yeah, um, read it like this. <laughs> um, uh, for example, uh, a sneaker, like uh, the sneakers, you know, the, the shoes, that would be, we would call that basket. Because when sneakers were introduced in France, it was like uh, through yeah basketball. So yeah, it's bound to be like like those shoes, and hence we say basket, but it means nothing. <laughs> it's a bit frustrating sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. English is everywhere, really. Yeah. Um, mm. I remember yesterday I watched uh, a video from Podcast Italiano. I don't know if you've mm. ever seen one of his videos but he made a video titled uh, l'inglese e ovunque it is mm -hmm. everywhere and he went around uh in the city the little town where he lives mm -hmm. um and it's not a tourist uh touristy place right but mm -hmm. there was still like in all the stores there was a lot of english like mm -hmm. um and i remember the thing that stood out to me the most was at a at an Italian traditional bookstore instead of libreria it said bookstore instead <laughs> of yeah um well if, if you're interested in this topic I'll try not to to talk too long about this uh France has a very weird relationship to English because um basically after world war ii we tried to kind of like the like our big guy back then was uh general de gaulle like he became president and he was trying to um sort of avoid american influence so technically from this area we have quotas in the radio and um uh basically they can play only 30 percent of uh like 
anything like in English, uh, like weird, like British songs, American songs. The rest is in French. And same thing with the media. We are really trying to kind of dub our films and not like no, you have no they, like subtitles became like more popular lately. But for the longest time, we just have a massive dub, like dub industry. So the words that were introduced to like French were introduced, but sort of without a context. And it may basically have a lot of, uh, you know, we'll say a, a t-shirt, like, you know, like a t-shirt, like <laughs> t-shirt, like we wouldn't necessarily say chemise or like, uh, I guess it's camisa in Spanish, right? The, yeah. Uh, 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 well, that, that's another piece of quote. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, different, uh, so we, we have like some words, but we twisted them. Like uh, uh, we would say something like disrupté, like uh, <laughs> because it sounds better than like to kind of chambouler or changer or like so yeah. lots of things like this but that without their context it's a very strange uh like, like uh way of uh, kind of like uh like uh, speaking english and if anything it parasites it in my opinion <laughs> it's a pretty common thing that you yeah. know, take something from english or any other language for that matter hmm. and kind of change its meaning make it more specific yeah because the chances are uh, maybe you already have this word in your language but you like you take it from another language in order to make it more yeah. specialized maybe yeah. in japanese also it's uh, it's really mm. the case mm. yeah um and what shocked me was when when looking into Le Verlon, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I saw that there were English words that were mm. used in Le Verlon, like yeah. Le Cubla, for <laughs> Le Cubla, <laughs> Cub yeah. or mm. like uh, De Spi for speed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That was surprising to see that they would take mm. English words and then reverse them. Um, yeah. So, like, for anyone that is not familiar, like, in French, it was... Uh, it got popular in, like, uh, mid-80s, like, uh, up to the 90s. Now we still use it, but, like, it's almost as a kind of, like, tongue-in-cheek. Like, it's... Uh, and so we... So this uh, verlan, like, if you switch it, it's like l'envers, which means, like, yeah, like um, how you call that? Like, yeah, you're switching. You're saying the beginning, the, yeah, yeah. You're saying, uh, <laughs> you're saying the end of the word, and then yeah. slang. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, some kind of slang. Uh, yeah, and yeah, yeah well, like uh, mm -hmm. the speed or speed. Like uh, actually, like we used to say that in uh, uh, like when I was a teen. Like yeah, definitely like uh, speed. Like like, like <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's interesting. Like uh, it's fun that you're still learning this. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. yeah, because some of the French people my age still use some of the verlan when they. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes um, um, some words like remain like kept, kept their popularity. Will still use uh, some. Uh, uh, for example, it's, it's still uh, pretty common to say something like uh, trying to think of like uh, muff. Yeah, muff is still pretty. Uh, it's still pretty uh, common, commonly used. But it's really like tongue in cheek, as in like the you know it's wouldn't be seen as uh, yeah, it can't be taken seriously if you're saying this. Even the person saying it sort of like uh, kind of uh, yeah, as best way I can put it. Like it's it's not like super. Uh, um, it's not like super modern like the, the basically the slang i was using when i was a teen is no longer like it's, it it sort of disappeared like it, it changes every 20 years or so and like same thing my grandparent my my parents would use some uh some uh, kind of uh, street slang that uh, completely disappeared too like a, it seemed like old-fashioned when i was uh, when i was a kid so every year or so you've got a cycle for like this kind of a uh, street uh, street talk that kind of uh, <laughs> like disappears like um yeah. and uh i think there there are like backward slangs like that in other languages i think in like mm. argentinian spanish there's something called lunfardo which is like mm. slang for, with a lot of italian influence um and i think mm. uh there's they have resbe like arreves 
uh, on yeah, them, yeah. right? Ah, yeah. Uh, cool. and they, so they do that uh, there. So yeah, mm -hmm. but it's interesting to just, you know, mm -hmm. make it backwards, um, to make it more informal or... Uh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, I've learned uh, something yeah. I didn't know, like it's, it's quite something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe like some kind of speaking in code, like kids do sometimes, yeah. like to mm -hmm. make it more interesting, to make it more mm -hmm. like, kind of yeah. challenging for others to understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, so now uh, we can go a little more into the comparison of mm. the Romance languages. So I'm gonna stick to Spanish, Italian, French, and Portuguese, just because I don't really know a lot about Romanian mm -hmm. or mm. Catalan or the other Romance yeah. languages. Um, so first, uh, there, these are some book recommendations. So the first one is a pretty thick uh, oh. comparative <laughs> Heavy read. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, of Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and French. So you can use it as a complete beginner to learn the language simultaneously, mm -hmm. or you can compare the languages. It's up to you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. right. And uh, like, for example, um, like if you go to a random page, it will just have like a table comparing the the different like a grammar rule in French, mm -hmm. Spanish, yeah. Italian, and Portuguese, but it always does it in this order: Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French. Mm -hmm. so you don't get confused. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then another one is is this one. It's a book about the history of the Romance languages, so of how Latin became. Mm -hmm. Uh, Spanish, French, mm. Portuguese, and Italian, right? Um, like vowel length, uh, verb ending, mm. things like that. Um, yeah. Okay. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have seen the first one being advertised in some polyglot like uh, forums. Mm. And there were some people that said it was confusing, but then of course there's always some negative comments, um, even when oh, yeah, it, but, it doesn't feel like there's anything negative to say. Hmm. But yeah, it's very yeah. But it, it talks about a lot of things that book, a lot of different rules and stuff. Um, so if you just want a book to reference things, to make comparisons, I mm -hmm. think that's a good book. But if you're more interested in like etymology or history, this one is good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah as well um yeah okay um so so first i wanted to talk about kind of the personality of mm. the romance languages so mm. la personalidad personalité personalita personalidad so um so spanish i think out of these four is the richest language in terms of uh, variation, right? The different accents, the yeah. different vocabularies from the different countries, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the small, you know, variations. Um, and then French, I think, is the most elegant, right? Just when I hear uh, <laughs> someone speak in French, I just... Mm. I just envision like someone who's very fancy, right? Just mm. uh, very elegant. Um, mm. And then Italian, I think, is the most beautiful one, like the most yeah. uh, melodious one. Mm. Um, it just has a really nice sound to it when you listen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then Portuguese is like very musical, especially Brazilian Portuguese which is what I want to speak actively, like the the oh sound, like the A with the tilde and the O, oh, like it, it, it has a kind of musicalness, musicality to it. Um, yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know what you guys uh, think about this, but. Uh, at the 
basically, I wish you could promise uh, prom uh, promise me never to come to France because your opinion of French as an elegant language would change pretty quickly. <laughs> no, <don't say> that. <laughs> okay, I'm 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 joking. But no, but yeah, always so. for native speaker, yeah. always mm. like it just sounds like the default. I guess mm. it can't sound elegant to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. it sounds elegant to many people. Mm. Does it sound elegant to you, Iglica? Um, uh, does it sound elegant? Yes, I would say so. Um, well, at least historically speaking, we really try to kind of uh, be extremely formal in the way we use uh, like a language, like, let's say. Um, it's seen as extremely bad taste to kind of twist the language too much. That's actually in my humble, uh, I, I think I'm absolutely not an expert in this field, but just the fact that slang absolutely does not last. Like uh, you'll have the street slang that disappears after like uh, 10 years and it's replaced by something else. It's a proof that we will try to really focus on the Kind of the core, like the the language's core, without really like uh, paying much attention to. Basically, we 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 very much about like keeping the grammar like and the kind of like the the form uh, alive rather than uh, just uh, to to even the detriment of uh, French as a language because we don't necessarily want to modernize it. Like we uh, also uh, another aspect uh, mm. linked to its sound that I think might make it appear elegant is. Yeah, the way it's kind of uniform, not really mm. stressed. Uh, that's kind of what elegance is, isn't it? Like the opposite of maybe kitsch or, you know, not, not very varied, right. but like sounding just like, just about right. Like you find yeah. some, very some like, tone that like, just no, keeps going. Yeah. Like calm, just like, like you could say anything, like mm -hmm. je voudrais un, uh, un mousse au chocolat and it just yeah. sounds very... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I smooth. Like I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> it does, yeah. I, I suppose I'm a native. I can't. I can't yeah, really yeah. see it for myself. Yes, but... <laughs> um, but yeah. And then Italian has a lot of rules that are specifically put in place to make things sound uh, better. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I see. Wow. And, uh... yeah, I struggle with the stress in Italian. Mm -hmm. For example, in Spanish. Like it's very clear where, where the stress should fall. You just have to know the rules. There are mm -hmm. no exceptions to them. Yeah, um, because in Spanish you have the three different types of words. So you have agudas, which are the the last syllable um, has the stress, mm -hmm. la última sílaba, and then mm -hmm. uh, llanas, which is the penultimate syllable, and mm -hmm. then uh esdrújulas or sobre esdrújulas which is third to last or fourth to last so mm -hmm. there's like very clear rules as mm -hmm. to when you put an accent when you don't um but uh in italian and french and portuguese the rules aren't as clear as to when mm -hmm. you put, yeah. um an accent um mm -hmm. yeah um yeah, interestingly enough, as um, like uh, it's not necessarily related to the personality, or although I'm not quite sure, like um, the it, even though Spanish is uh, a bit, uh, uh, it's it's more uh, like uh, French is supposed is uh, quite close to Italian. I do feel like at least like I had no issue whatsoever. Uh, learning a bit of Spanish, like I'm far from being a... <laughs> yes, actually, I think we're going to talk about this yeah. in a second, like how, then, to what extent they, you know, yeah. they're mutually understandable. Then I guess I'll, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll keep that for later. <laughs> yeah. um, don't worry. Uh, so yeah. we, can, we can go to the next slide yeah. and start looking mm. at that. So, so the vocabulary, uh, mm. vocabulario, vocabulaire, vocabulario, yeah. Vocabulario. So, mm. um, so Spanish and Portuguese uh, have roughly eighty nine percent lexical similarity. So that has to do just with geographical location. So the Iberian Peninsula was conquered by the Romans and then the Moors for a long time. So they share a lot of vocabulary that comes from 
Arabic. Like, for example, um, in Arabic, the word for uh, oil is like azate. And then in Spanish, it's aceite. Um, in Portuguese, it's uh, something similar. Um, and then French and Italian. So the, they're also very close in terms of uh, lexical, so the vocabulary. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that, um, I guess it also has to do with geographical location. They're very close to each other. Um, but there are a lot of words that just are very similar. Um, like even the word for vocabulary is similar in mm -hmm. the four um, languages. Um, and then Spanish and Italian are still pretty close in lexical similarity, like 80%. Uh, and then Spanish, French, and Portuguese are the furthest apart if you compare them to French, uh, 75 percent mm -hmm. lexical similarity. Um, I don't know what uh, you guys, if you've had any experiences that show uh, that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, just instinctively without knowing Portuguese, I would have guessed uh, like that it's a very, very large similarity. Mm -hmm. I'm even a bit surprised yeah. that there is the same between French and Italian. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how you feel about it. Um, yeah, the, the truth of the matter is, it's um, it's clearly there. If you kind of force yourself, if, uh, I force myself to, uh, let's say, uh, watch an Italian film without su uh, subtitles, for example. After a while, it, you know, like your ear kind of picks up, but it will not come naturally, sort of like. Right. And, um... Because on, on paper, like, because when we're talking about vocabulary, just re regardless of the pronunciation and that, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. they're very similar, French and Italian. Yeah, like, yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. Of Words mm -hmm. that, um, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of actual just words taken from French used mm -hmm. in Italian, like uno stage for an internship mm -hmm. or yeah. garage for garage mm -hmm. um, yeah um, very uh -huh. difficult to italian like taking words from being yeah. french or english even though they don't seem to kind of fit the rhythm of the language where mm -hmm. you would expect like a vowel at the end yeah they would readily use words even that don't correspond to, to these conventions and i suppose the reason why a french person would struggle is because of the uh, kind of italian stresses and uh, accent and like seed as well like uh, Although I've, I've, been told, fast, yeah, <laughs> I've been told that uh, when a French person talks fast, it's also quite uh, difficult to follow. So. <laughs> but yeah, that's... Um, yeah. It makes a lot of elisions, like English, like, hmm. like in English, you, you'll say I'ma, like I'm going to, I'ma. Yeah. And in mm -hmm. French, you could say je me suis douché, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I took yeah. a shower, mm -hmm. je me suis, you really mm -hmm. mix... Yeah. Words. Yeah, you're eating the. <laughs> yeah, you could sort of eating the the last uh, <laughs> table there. Uh, um, and so, even though ironically, even though like Spanish is uh, more removed from the uh, from French, like maybe because of the kind of the speed, the uh, the speed of the way the language is structured, I would say like. Um, yeah, that more than yeah. you Italian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. which is quite ironic. When you come to come to think of it, uh, yes, even though like mm. even vocabulary that is not the same. For example, uh, I can't give an example. Maybe did you say something that mm. something based on dinero for money that uh, could yeah. be used? Mm, yeah, even though it's not the same word, you can kind of sense the root. <laughs> exactly. So dinero, like uh, you know, you see money. Like you would have uh, an old-fashioned word for like coin in French would be denier, like. That was some, can't remember if it was some old currency or really the, the coin itself, but like denier, dinero, like sort of like uh, same thing with the sueños, sueños, son. Mm. So, you know, you kind of, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have like, uh, if your French vocabulary is good, you kind of pick up with uh, some some words like, uh, right. yeah. <laughs> um, 
so then in terms of the grammar uh it's a, it follows a similar pattern right mm -hmm. so yeah. spanish and portuguese are probably closer to each other grammar wise and french and italian grammar wise as well mm -hmm. um, yeah like in spanish and portuguese i'm using the book as mm -hmm. reference but yeah. uh for example in french in French and Italian, you have the the pronouns on and e. Ne, yeah, the same e, as ne and ti. Don't have that in Spanish and Portuguese, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in Spanish and Portuguese, to say like I just did something, you would say acabar de plus mm -hmm. whatever, right? Acaba g, right? Acabo de cenar. I just mm -hmm dinner right mm -hmm. yeah. um, um i just mm -hmm. studied right so like grammar wise like in the verb mm -hmm. tenses, the pronouns the rules they all share a lot of them right but mm -hmm. french and italian have some things that spanish and portuguese don't and vice versa um mm -hmm. yeah I don't know if you remember at university, there was a course that was especially made um, Portuguese for speakers of Spanish. And through taking this course, you could skip through the three first levels of Spanish. Yeah. So, of, no, of Portuguese. It assumes yeah. you speak Spanish. And instead of starting with like Portuguese level one, you would just take this like conversion course from Spanish to Portuguese, and then you could start with level four. Mm -hmm. It felt like, wow, are they that similar? And yeah. I always wondered what exactly they would be doing mm -hmm. in this course, like just uh, yeah. juxtaposing the two languages mm -hmm. throughout the whole course. Yeah. Um, uh, this summer, I'm going to do a Portuguese program at uh, Middlebury College. Um, it's a, it's a program for college students, but they let some high school students go. So, uh, and, you're, and you have to take a language pledge. You can only speak uh, in Portuguese. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because they do have a level for Spanish speakers. It says uh -huh. mm -hmm. well, Spanish speakers. So that, mm -hmm. uh, that made me, that reminded me of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow, that, that's so cool. You must be looking forward to, <laughs> to this. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Like we, we really don't have that type of uh, like fun things for languages. Like I wonder why actually. In Europe in general? No, in, at least in France. In France, like, uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. We don't, I don't know. <laughs> we're, we're not very practical with all our with our approach of languages. It, it's there. funny you say that because usually people, when when you say you're American, they don't think you can speak a language well uh -huh. because yeah. because yeah. most most Americans or English speakers in general don't bother to learn uh, foreign mm -hmm. foreign languages. Um, mm -hmm. But there's so many enthusiasts that our native speakers of English. No. I think we, we've seen this in, in England mm. uh, and also many American people are super interested in yeah. languages. Mm. I don't know, maybe that's the reason, maybe because there is like a general lack of interest among the majority of people, yeah. but there's definitely individuals who are yeah. like, really, like really Luke. Um, Luke, Luke, yeah, yeah absolutely. Luke is a good example. Yeah. He knows yeah. so yeah. much about all of these languages and Latin, especially, he knows well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah, I can, I can tell, for example, as uh, someone who had a father who could uh, speak an, another language, they never made it, it didn't, even, it didn't even make it clear, like, to what extent he could speak. Uh, like, yeah, basically, he spoke, uh, sometimes he would just say, uh, like, a couple of words in uh in German or in Russian as a joke, but I have no idea to which extent basically could actually speak the <laughs> these two languages, but because his parents would use it at home, so it's sort of like you lose it over a generation or so, like uh, even if you have like uh, roots from somewhere else. So, 
we try to avoid that with Stefan yes, <laughs> or some well, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I guess fashions change here mm. which uh, right now I think it's pretty common to to try to make sure your children are bilingual even if you do not mm. to, like have a second language at home yeah. you would make sure I, they take mm. lessons when they're very young mm. another example of the grammar sim the grammatical similarities is that in Spanish and Portuguese, like the subjunctive, there's mm. six verb tenses in that mood. But yeah. in French and Italian, there's four. Um, yeah. Mm. But in French, you only really use two. But in Italian, you use all four. So oh, I see. Yeah. So in Spanish and Portuguese, you have the present subjunctive, the the past subjunctive, the imperfect subjunctive, the pluperfect, mm. and then you have the future subjunctive, uh, and then uh, I'm not the future perfect subjunctive, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. but in Italian, you just have present, past, imperfect, pluperfect, and in mm. French, you also technically have them, but you only really use the present and past subjunctive yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's very yes. much it. the past yeah. even not that much mm. i've been reading something in spanish and i noticed just how readily the past subjunctive was used well, yeah. in french not really and i was thinking about how you go around it i think i didn't think about it enough yeah. but it's not used that much no. yeah um the subjunctive is really an interesting topic, given the way it's used, the, um, the situations in which it's used differ from language to language. Like in Italian, maybe it's used the most often from what I know, even with things like I think, uh, it can be right. used or because if. Yeah. In Italian, you use it in affirmative sentences as well, um, like mm -hmm. not just non penso che, but also mm -hmm. penso che. Penso yeah. che sia yeah. una buona idea uh, di fare questo compito adesso, right? You mm -hmm. just an affirmative sentence. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 we streamlined this one. <laughs> But yeah. Um, and then the the pronunciation. So here it the pattern changes a mm -hmm. bit. So yeah. Spanish and Italian are phonetic languages. So you mm -hmm. read what's written. Like if you look here, pronunciación, yeah. what's mm. written. Pronuncia, right? For Italian, mm. pronuncia, right? Pronunciación, mm. pronuncia. But then okay. in mm. French and Portuguese, which are non-phonetic, you do not read what's written necessarily. So <laughs> it's pronuncia. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and th this isn't the best example for Portuguese, but it's pronuncia, right? But yeah. in other in other cases, you don't really read what's written like in English. There's a lot of uh, differences between how you write and how you speak. I think I sense some of these differences, even by you just reading the titles like the D is pronounced like J or something. Mm. Uh, it's things I saw for the first time. Mm. Uh, yeah, it really didn't look like the way you read them. Oh, didn't look yeah, like the like, way they were written. Like the like here, grammatica, grammaire, right? Mm. You don't really pronounce it how it's written. But yeah. then you have Italian grammatica, and then Portuguese grammatica. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the grammatica. Yeah, and then um. Right, vocabulario, vocabulaire, vocabulario, mm. vocabulario, um, mm -hmm. personalidad, personalité, personalita, yeah. personalidade. Mm -hmm. um, but that's yeah. Brazilian Portuguese, specifically mm -hmm. how I'm reading it. Um, in European Portuguese, it would just be personalidade, personalidade, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so, um, and then also, uh, so just some specific things to each language. So in Spanish, the B and the V are, are very particular, right? Because they sound almost the same, right? Mm -hmm. La B y la V 
are very similar. Um, mm -hmm. it, there isn't a V like in English or French or, it, or Italian. There isn't yeah. a V sound. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also have um, uh, the retracted S in Spain that's particular to that. Um, you have um, you have like an H sound for a J, like La Jota is really like an H sound in Latin America, most of it, um, because mm -hmm. in French and Italian and Portuguese, you don't really have that H sound. Yeah. It doesn't really oh. exist. Mm -hmm. um, so and in, the, uh, in Portuguese too, they don't pronounce the, the H. Uh, like, um, yeah. Yeah. But it, their R's are similar to an H. So like, mm. um, where was it? Like vocabulario. Like, uh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vocabulario. It's mm. similar to that. Mm. Um, and then uh, Italian has the famous le doppie, right? Um, mm. Like here, grammatica, right? It's not mm. grammatica. No, it's gramma. It's a double yeah. consonant, right? Because if you, and sometimes if you mess it up, you can say something you really don't want to say. Like, for example, <laughs> for year, it's anno. But mm. if you say anno, that means anus, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you, you really want to make sure uh, you mm. pronounce it correctly. But the best yeah. way to do it is just when there's a double consonant you take away the stress on the preceding vowel so like here um instead of saying grammatica no you say grammatica grammatica mm. you really don't pronounce the a um too much and then um yeah and then in italian you really don't write H is that much only in like CH, but um, besides that, like for example, like to say uh, history, you say um, storia, you don't say, you don't write H I S T O R A like in Spanish or histoire in French with an H. They really yeah. don't write those those H's, so that's more of the spelling. Um, mm -hmm. And then French has the the E and the U, right? Yeah. The famous E and U sounds. Yeah. Um, it can be quite tough. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Not very good here. Mm -hmm. The the, 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 mm -hmm. the J E the the J the nasal sounds. Um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. um, right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then Portuguese has different nasal sounds, like, like for to say tambien, like also mm. you say tambien. It's not mm. like it's ain tambien, ain. Um, and uh, what else? Um, what else? Uh, Italian. So Spanish has five vowel sounds, right? A, E, I, O, U. That's it. But then Italian has A, E, E, I, O, O, U, right? Like, for mm. example, um, like, uh, essere, right? Or um, because you have the open E and the closed E. Right. Mm. Um, uh, and then in French too, like première, première, mm. um, éléphant, première, yeah. éléphant. Um, mm. And then, but Italian also has the the O, right? Like, um, um, like vocabulario, right? Like, um, yeah. the, the O and the O. Right. Um, so there's differences in like the vowel sounds there too. Um, and and French has the the circonflex, the little hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In French, so, it really affects the writing as well, mm, putting the right yeah. stress um, yeah. the right way.
But uh, it's interesting that the only reason the circumflex is there is because there used to be an S after yeah. the, the vowel. Like, mm -hmm. like for fet, like a party, it used to be fest, right? Mm -hmm. Like fest yeah. or fiesta, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a similar one with O, isn't it? Like hospital has a, a little thing or am I yes. confusing it with another language? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that's French, me, think because so. <laughs> yeah, it's like hospital, hospital, but in mm. French, hospital, and it requires mm. the the sign to to show the lack of the s that yeah. that fell off from from the original like, mm. Latin word. Yeah, uh, yeah. like sometimes we just simplify it. Like a lot of people give the accent circumflex, and mm. that the, there's been a. Kind of like in the national debate, like at some point we wanted to drop it, like drop it off on entirely, but we decided to keep it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, the the ng in Spanish, you have the letter, right? The n with the tilde, the accent. Um, but in Italian, it's just gn. In French, it's gn. Uh, yeah. And in Portuguese, it's NH, right? So that's mm -hmm. also interesting. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, so now uh, we can talk a little bit about a little change of subject. So, so language, foreign language education. So, um, so I wanted to start by just uh, a little story. So um, since I was 12 uh, for community service, I've taught uh, English, ELL, English language learners, it's called, to immigrant adults, mostly Spanish speaking, but also from other countries. Um, so that has also like helped me uh, like get better at learning languages as well um, and uh, and has made me understand my own mother tongue of English better but it really it's about like how you teach a language right because at school um, for most people it doesn't really work that well how they teach you a language in school, like with the traditional um, method. Because most of my friends have taken Spanish, French for years mm -hmm. and they can barely speak anything. Yes. Yeah. In Europe um, is the case with English mostly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not just because it works for some people, like it worked for me, for French doesn't mean it works for most people, right? Yeah. So I think um, a lot of methods that uh, I've been discovering that I wish I had known before that I think would have made my language learning even more efficient, like the nature method. Um, Luke always talks about his favorite mm -hmm. book for learning Latin, right? Lingua Latina per se illustrata. But mm -hmm. there's versions of that for French um, that I wish I had known before, but I only mm, discovered yeah. it a few months ago, right? Le Francais uh, par la méthode nature mm. um, or uh, l'italiano secondo il metodo natura. Um, mm. And uh, Spanish, there's poco a poco. Um, mm. So all of these like nature methods that are based on like comprehensible input and extensive reading, like there's a lot of different ways to like learn a language, but it depends on what works best for you. So you have to like find what works best for you. Mm -hmm. um, like there's so many different resources, um, but I think an important thing to always remember is that you have to speak because if yeah. you don't speak, you're never going to learn the language. Like mm -hmm. even if you make mistakes, you have to speak because when you make those mistakes, you'll usually not want to make them again to avoid sounding <laughs> silly, right? So yeah. it's to just 
speak um mm. a lot um yeah. and uh in terms mm. of pronunciation a lot of people say that it's like impossible to speak like a native speaker and it is it's it's impossible to speak a language perfectly even yeah. for even for a native speaker but it's mm -hmm. possible to get close to doing that um mm -hmm. but the most important thing is to listen because most people don't listen carefully um they say oh i can't pronounce it correctly but you really have to like observe the how they move their mouth right you have to really listen to the subtleties and just try to imitate it and exaggerate at the beginning and slowly you won't have to exaggerate that mm -hmm. much. yeah um and uh just you know youtube you can learn languages on youtube um mm -hmm. like looking at channels like yours or other channels as well <laughs> um yeah. no, uh pas de quoi um <laughs> Yeah, but it, it depends on, on the person, right? Um, mm. Like maybe you're the kind of person who could learn like five languages at once, but maybe you're the kind of person who really needs to stick to just one or two languages. Um, it really depends on, on how you learn. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. the most important thing is just to listen carefully and to speak. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes, actually, mm. I've heard from some of our younger viewers, like a strange motivation, like expressed as, I decided I want to be a polyglot, <laughs> which is sounded really like they didn't take the time to, yeah. to define the goal and how they would like to achieve it. Um, when it comes to languages, I think we, we are uh, sort of an interesting example because I think we work completely differently. Mm -hmm. You're very like uh, you're very much about um, learning through exercises and uh, yeah, I love the grammar yeah, and yeah, the things mm -hmm. that most people hate. <laughs> oh yeah, I I love the grammar too. <laughs> yeah, it's so mm -hmm. useful. It's so <laughs> interesting. Yeah, and uh, whereas for me, I'm, I'm I think I'm much messier. Like, uh, uh, yes. unfortunately, the first language that I tried to learn was German, and just like you said, I like studied it in uh, in school and uh, kind of dropped it. Like the few kind of like uh, expression expressions and uh, kind of uh, idioms that, that I picked yeah. was what from watching uh, like uh, like. Uh, uh tv and like shows in german and that that was it a sort of uh like the like, I, I, I yeah. never really picked it up which is a bit of a shame and when it comes to english it's very much like i started like learning it Just when i was it. yeah using it uh mm -hmm. over the years like i was really truly introduced to it when i was like what eight or nine and like all the time like really picking it up like them staying in England helped a lot like yeah. you know, uh, and I made a lot of mistakes at first but yeah uh, tu <laughs> bien l'anglais pour un français parce qu'en général <laughs> euh, les français ont <laughs> tendance euh, à avoir des difficultés avec mm -hmm. la prononciation but uh -huh. you oui. speak very well um, uh, thank you but uh, j'ai fait comme tu as dit C'est-à-dire que I, I like to imitate people. I like imitating sounds and uh, and uh, and uh, you know playing characters and things like this. And uh, over time, I was like, okay, so they pronounce things like this. Like it's always oh, really specific, and uh, and it's kind of how I, I picked up some Bulgarian as well. Like I'm far from being good yeah, at it. Yeah, but the accent but, is amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I was like, oh, okay, so that's how they say hello. It's like, oh, that's complicated. Zdra, zdrave, zdrave. And then, like all the time, it's like, <laughs> like it's really complicated, like to add those sounds together. It's fun. I'll try to do that. And like, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, I guess that's how I pick up languages. So we're quite mm -hmm. different in this regard. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. like, not to discourage like younger viewers or mm. something. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's not super difficult. Like, it's not that you're going to be trying hard with right. a certain method, but yeah. not managing and not managing. The chances are, if you want to learn a language, you will see progress oh. uh, really soon. 
Yeah, yeah it's all about uh, motivation. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So very interesting, like to this uh, this approach of like learning, sort of uh, see yeah. how different people might. Um, yeah. um, it's amazing that you have this experience mm -hmm. at your young age uh, teaching language to people. Yeah. I think it's really really unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and when you teach a language, you really uh, deepen your understanding of it. Um, so, like, I want to be a language teacher because that way I can get better and better at the languages I've mm -hmm. learned by teaching them, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Because then you really have to understand it to be able to explain it to somebody, to somebody else. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think it's important to learn the grammar rules, but for some people, it's more important to just be exposed to the language a lot and then learn the rules. Um, yeah. For some people, the other way around, but uh, I think it's important to have a balance, right? Um, mm -hmm. Different sources, not just using one method, you know, you can change it up every once in a while um yeah, yeah so yeah. i can share a few texts uh i've i've written um so let me yeah of course yeah okay um so this first text is uh is a, is a small uh, Spanish uh, assignment I had to do for my uh, mother tongue class last year. We read uh, Crónica de una Muerte Anunciada um, mm -hmm. by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Wow. And um, we had to do a creative writing piece okay. at the end mm -hmm. of the unit. And I decided to to rewrite the story, obviously a lot shorter um, mm -hmm. uh, with a different ending, right? So now mm -hmm. instead of Cronica de una muerte anunciada, like it's announced and he ends up dying still, it's prevenida, right? They prevented it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs. So, mm -hmm. el día que lo querían matar... Santiago Nazar se levantó a las cinco y media de la mañana para esperar el buque en que llegaba el obispo. Había soñado andar por un bosque de higuerones donde se sentía feliz hasta que se levantó sintiéndose cagado por pájaros. Le contó su sueño a su madre, Plácida Linero quien tenía reputación de poder entender el significado de los sueños de otros. Santiago notó que la expresión de cansancio en la cara de su madre cambió a una de preocupación cuando mencionó los árboles. Plácida le advirtió a su hijo del augurio asiago Bad Omen, que significaban los árboles y que tuviera mucho cuidado. Santiago se alarmó, inocente como yo lo conocía, um, because uh, Gabriel García Márquez mixed the third and first person, so that's why it just... Mm -hmm. yo, I was trying to imitate his style a bit, so... Santiago se alarmó inocente como yo lo conocía y bajó a tomar su café. Después de terminarlo, Santiago se dirigió a la puerta fatal, la de menos uso, que conducía a la plaza para recibir al obispo. Justo antes de salir por esa puerta, pisó en un sobre. El pobre Santiago, ahora más confundido, lo abrió. El sobre tenía un papel adentro. Cuando él vio lo que estaba escrito en el papel, sus ojos se hicieron grandes, como los de un búho, an owl. El mensaje anónimo detallaba las intenciones de Pablo y Pedro Vicario, hermanos de Ángela Vicario, que se casó con Bayardo San Román la, la noche anterior 
y fue devuelta dos horas después del matrimonio por no ser virgen, right? So these are the brothers of a woman who got married the night before and they found out that she um, wasn't a virgin and they're accusing Santiago Nazar. So they want to kill him. Um, mm -hmm. Esta noticia fue triste para Santiago ya que todos éramos amigos. Las pupilas de Santiago se achicaron gracias a una luz radiante que atravesó la puerta cerrada, creando un hueco el tamaño de una pelota de tenis. Esta luz iluminó la mente de Santiago y finalmente pudo entender la advertencia de su madre. So that's just a, the beginning of my little uh, piece of writing. Um, so, so Spanish is my mother tongue, so I'm comfortable yes. writing yes. in. in it can Spanish. totally be sensed by yeah. just the play of language, mm -hmm. uh, the points of yeah. view, the rich yeah. and the vocabulary, the creativity. Just mm -hmm. one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, this thing about the light uh, making a hole in the door the size of a tennis ball Um, mm. It's to imitate the magical realism that Gabriel Garcia Marquez used. Yeah. Like he uh -huh. used a lot of things that couldn't really happen, but it has like a metaphorical meaning, right? Mm. Like la luz iluminó la mente de Santiago, right? It, mm. it, it, yeah. He understood uh, what his mother was uh, warning him about. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. yeah. Magical realism is very, mm. very um, highly used in Latin America, I think, yeah. in Russia as well. Mm. So. I love um, another book I really like uh, is La Casa de los Espíritus, The House of the Spirits um, by <laughs> Isabel Allende is another mm. great uh, magical uh, realist book. Um, okay. So now uh, here is a French piece I wrote last year. So last year I was put in a mother tongue class. So it was my, my first time uh, studying literature in French. Wow. So, it was, so it, was, it was challenging, but my French got a lot better over that, the course of that year. And the reason why I haven't gotten rid of the corrections my teacher made is to show that it's normal to make yeah. uh, mistakes right so yes absolutely yeah. we yeah. really encourage this on our channel like full lessons full conversations including the mistakes because yeah. it's only normal like it's easy to just say a couple of sentences in a language and be like uh, yeah. yes we that's speak it. like yeah. 20 30 languages yeah. without mistakes but that's not how it works in real life mm. So, and so for this exercise, I had to do a transposition de l'histoire. So I had to yeah. adapt the story to a different time period. So this yeah. is a, a book by Sébastien uh, Japrizo um, mm -hmm. about uh, um, like World War I era, kind of a mystery type yeah. book uh, about love and Uh, those kinds of topics. So I uh, adapted it to uh, ancient uh, Greece. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I, have, uh, I had a quick read through it. Uh, it's really well written. Well done. <laughs> yeah. uh, merci beaucoup. Um, no, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, C'est très bien écrit. <laughs> Un long dimanche de fiançailles, transposition. Mm -hmm. Il était une fois cinq hoplites corinthiens qui faisaient la guerre parce que les choses sont ainsi. C'était un dimanche matin. La rivière Némé reflétait le soleil brillant. Les pèneries rouges chantaient et l'eau glissait sur les rochers. Cependant, ces sons ont été noyés par les bruits d'épées qui se heurtaient des soldats qui criaient à cause de la douleur et des boucliers qui tombaient. C'était la bataille de Némé, 394 avant Jésus-Christ. Mmh. Les Athéniens ont été défaits par les Spartiates. Maintenant, les Spartiates s'avançaient vers les alliés des Athéniens. 
y compris les 3000 hoplites corinthiens. Un groupe des Spartiates a vu cinq hoplites corinthiens avec leurs bras liés dans les dos. Ils ont été surpris par la manière dont les Corinthiens traitaient leurs frères. Pourquoi ont-ils laissé cinq soldats seuls au milieu de la bataille sans défense C'était parce qu'ils avaient été condamnés à mort. Um, so that's uh, just um, because in the, in the actual story, it's World War I. The yeah. trenches, right? France versus uh, Germany. Um, mm -hmm. But this time it's the Spartans versus the Corinthians. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, um, well done for reading the numbers. That's uh, <laughs> 80, uh, 94. It's not uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, uh, that has to do with um, uh, the influence from the Gauls, I think. The 80. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. the soixante-dix that comes from the Gauls uh, yeah. that lived in in the French territory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So here uh, is a small text I wrote a year ago um, for my Italian tutor about a, an interesting 45-minute uh, video I watched about the linguistic diversity in Italy. So... Um, il discorso il paese poliglota viaggio attraverso la diversità linguistica dell'Italia di Davide Bozzo parla delle diverse lingue o dialetti che sono parlate in Italia ed anche parla delle minoranze linguistiche. Uh, prima di tutto il signor Bozzo spiega che l'italiano è veramente il dialetto toscano o più precisamente il, il dialetto fiorentino utilizzato da Dante nella letteratura. In secondo luogo parla dei diversi dialetti italiani che sono di fatto delle lingue sorelle, sister languages, dell'italiano perché vengono dal latino e non dall'italiano. Si possono dividere in due famiglie settentrionali e centro-meridionali. I dialetti sono simili all'italiano, ma qualche volta non sono molto comprensibili. La maggior parte degli italiani sono bilingui perché parlano l'italiano e il dialetto della loro regione. In ultimo luogo, il signor Bozzo parla delle minoranze linguistiche come i dialetti che derivano dal francese, dal tedesco e dallo sloveno. Per esempio, in Val d'Aosta, in Piemonte, circa 90.000 uh, persone parlano il franco provenzale, un dialetto francese. Um, Okay, very interesting topic. Yeah, yeah, it is. Mm. Yeah, um, German, Romanian. <laughs> the neighbors. Yeah. And then um, just to finish, so this is a small uh, poem, a Portuguese poem by a, a Brazilian writer, uh, Carlos Drummond de Andrade. Um, mm. It's a famous poem, very simple, short. Um, so, no meio do caminho, in the, in the middle of the path. Yeah. Um, no meio do caminho tinha uma pedra. Tinha uma pedra no meio do caminho. Tinha uma pedra no meio do caminho. Tinha uma pedra. So, um, in the middle of the path. So, here they're using the verb te, like tener, um, mm. instead of haber, because it's, <laughs> it's a more informal usage of like ilia, like haber, mm. so they, instead of using abe, they use te, right, chinha, there was mm. uma pedra, uh, a rock, a stone, um, mm. chinha uma pedra no meio do caminho, so he repeats, there was a stone in the middle of the path. 
Um, and then in the second uh, stanza, Nunca me esquecerei desse acontecimento. I will never forget about that event, right? Um, mm. That time. Uh, na vida de minhas retinhas tal fatigadas. Uh, in the life of my uh, retinas that are so tired. Um, yeah. Nunca me esquecerei que no meio do caminho tinha uma pedra. Tinha uma pedra no meio do caminho. No meio do caminho tinha uma pedra. So, um, so it's just, so it's a very like short but metaphorical poem, right? About mm. a stone being in the middle of the path. So like mm. some sort of obstacle um yeah. in his life um mm. yeah. yeah yeah great yeah thank you i think that's uh, it's a beautiful image <laughs> yes. yeah they can be mm. yeah, pretty um, mm. significant expressions including poetic uh -huh. with just little language being used and um mm. here the so this is another example of differences between the Romance languages. So in Spanish and Portuguese, um, when you're talking about the past, you'll use the simple past and the, the present perfect, right? But in French and Italian, you really only use the present perfect. So um, here, this is the the simple past, right? Me ishkesere, right? Mm. Uh, um, well, well, this is uh, the future simple, actually, but mm. um, it just, it reminded me of how uh, in Portuguese and Spanish you have that simple uh, past. Um, and then in French also the yeah. passé simple is very rarely used even when I see it in some forms like the je with yeah. the ae at the end. I was like, what's that? <laughs> it took me a moment to realize mm. the passé simple in the first person. Mm. Usually it's like either the nous or... Uh, yeah, probably yeah. reading a book, I guess. <laughs> I was reading a book, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, just to finish quickly, um so let me share okay can you see the screen again yes yes mm. okay um so uh just before uh we end um if you would like to contact me you can contact me on discord um that's my username or on reddit um that's also my username um and because Iglika and Alex are too nice and too humble to say it, um, you should subscribe uh, to their YouTube channel, uh, <laughs> like uh, the video and uh, turn on the bell to receive notifications so you don't miss their, their videos. No. Thank, Thank you for you. the shout out. <laughs> Very kind of you. No, no problem. <laughs> Um, and so uh, actually you taught us uh, a lot like we never really uh, like uh, like perceive like all Latin languages in this uh, context. Um, and I think Iglica would have an interesting uh, perspective on uh, Romanian as well. Like it's also something to keep I don't mind, know it much. Uh, yeah. 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 It's, it's nice. like the Slavic yeah. uh, Romance yeah. language. Yes. Mm. Like Romance is the Germanic one. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like Romance would be like very interesting to me because we did spend some time in uh, in Alsace and I could see that at some point like the Germanic dialect came, was a bit closer to Latin uh, than what it became afterwards. So yeah, I'll definitely check that out like uh, <laughs> as soon as I can, the, like the Romance language. So, well done, Emilio, for this presentation. Yeah, like, great. Uh, Thank yeah. you so much. We, we learned a lot yeah, and, and uh, I'm sure the, mm. the audience did too. It's very yeah. inspiring, very mm. encouraging to, yeah. uh, to mm. see what an amazing level and what amazing interest you have in these languages. So we mm. wish you to continue this way and yeah. we're sure we'll, you'll speak like 10 languages in a couple of years <laughs> at this rate. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay. Donc, euh, bah, toutes okay. nos félicitations, c'était très bien. Merci beaucoup. <rire> euh, merci à vous aussi. Um, yeah. And, uh, if you want, like, uh, le mot de la fin. Or... <laughs> like, uh, Anything you want to say to, um, to the viewers? Um, just, to, uh, just to stay motivated and uh, to just speak, to not be afraid. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah, so thanks again. Good job. Like, I was really quite something. And uh, yeah, well, keep it up. <laughs> yeah.